Hello, everyone. So uh, this next lecture is going to be about uh, one hour long. We're going to have to kind of speed run through it a little bit. First of all, uh, my name is Bruno Fonseca, and I'm a VFX artist. I've been in the industry for about like 12 years now, almost 12 years. Two of those in uh, Twatar. All right, so um, in two days, uh, my presentation will be about character effects. So I'm going to start sharing my screen right away. Okay. So uh, this, uh, this project is just a default Unreal third-person um, preset. And, um, and when you think about you know, character effects, I think the first thing that comes to mind is you know, adding particles to, to a character, like sampling the skeletal mesh, getting the position of the bones, spawning particles on them, or like spawning on the, on the surface triangles, right? So I have an example of that over here of some fire. And uh, as you see, like it's you know it's something. It's uh, somewhat functional, but uh, it's missing something, right? It's, uh, it seems very basic. And then here I have an example of that same particle system, but with a, an effect happening on the character surface as well. And you can see it's like a much more complete effect. You know, it has more depth, more complexity to it. So it's like so much nicer, right? So we're going to be focusing on that part today. Right, we're not going to be touching particles. We're going to be touching effects on the character surface only. So when we talk about effects on a character surface, there's uh, two main ways to go about it. One will be doing uh, the effects on the character shader itself, as we have here. I'm just flashing the character, right? And I've added this, uh, this logic to the character material itself. Another way would be to use the shell mesh like we have here. So if I click here and move, you see I have a shell mesh that's just overlaying, just sitting on top of the character. So uh, those two methods are very, um, very valid, both of them, right? They just have pros and cons depending on your project. You know, you might, uh, might want to choose one over the other or even both, you know? So uh, pros and cons. Uh, the one on the left, the shell mesh method, since you're rendering a secondary mesh as an overlay to a mesh that already exists there, you have an, you know, an extra draw call and you have a draw call and you have uh, also some, uh, some overdraw going on. So if you look into the shader complexity view mode, do not out save, please. You're going to see that it is a bit more expensive once it finishes. Yeah, there you go. See, it's like slightly more expensive because we have you know, those two surfaces uh, rendering. And the example on the right looks cheaper, right? But on the shell mesh example, when you're done with the shell mesh, you can just hide it, right? You don't have to have it rendering all the time. So in that case, if you hide it, like I did here, and look at shader complexity again, you see that the one on the right, now it's the more expensive. And why is that? If you're executing something on the logic, executing the shader logic in the character shader itself, you will always be paying for that cost, even if the effect is not enabled at all, right? Can't avoid that. And uh, we're going to build both of these examples today. I'm going to be building them like in a bit of a kind of quick and dirty manner, and I'll be implementing them using the character blueprint, which is not usually the way you want to go about this. It's like very, you know, it's a big no-no. But just for the sake of time, I'm going to do that. But if you want to see how uh, this this sort of effect would uh, fit inside a bigger production. There's a great uh, GDC talk that you can look at from Bill Cladis and uh, Fortnite. There's a, it's a very long talk. has like a lot of uh, really good stuff, you know. Uh, talks about weapon effects, character effects, and uh, how those systems scale in a project the size of Fortnite. The talk is free. You can see slides of it. You can watch a video of it. You see here there's like, uh, you know, some character effects as well. So just uh, Google for GDC Vault. Bill Cladis, or I can also post the links on the chat. Let me just copy paste them on the chat. Okay, so I uh, guess we can start building it. So let me just move over here. I'll just leave those examples there. I'm going to build one from scratch. So this is my character. I'm going to start prototyping this on the, just on the skeletal mesh itself. I'm going to just pop it here on the map. Just leave it there. Okay, since uh, this, uh, uh, this effect is first of all the flashing one would happen on the character shader itself, I'm going to be opening the body material over here. It has a bunch of stuff here. I'm not going to touch that stuff. I'm going to put my logic here right at the end before the output. 
But I'm going to do that inside a material function. So let's uh, first create this material function here on my VFX folder. Right click, material function, MF, character FX. Let's just open it. It's a blank function, has nothing on it. And uh, if you just jump back into the uh, character material, we're going to see that uh, it's outputting material attributes. So if you're not familiar with this, it's like um, if you disable this uh, tick box here, use material attributes, you're going to see that uh, this is going to expand. You're going to show all of those uh, inputs like base color, metallic, roughness, specular, emissive, opacity, normals, and everything, right? What the material attributes does is just combines everything into a single wire. So that's for, you know, for convenience, so for like more readability in the shader. So our function, let's go back to it. We're going to create a function input, and this input is going to be a material attributes input. Right now, I just want to pipe it through it here. Just uh, input, output, same thing. It's not going to do anything. I'm going to save it. And then I'm ready to pop it here inside my material. So I'm just going to hold Control. Put this wire here and this wire over there. So I'm just kind of intercepting this and adding this, uh, all this math towards the end of the shader. OK, so once inside my function, actually, I'm going to uh, highlight my uh, skeletal mesh here in the content browser and click on the teapot over here so I can preview on the character mesh itself. Same for this. It's more useful than a sphere, right? Don't want to ponder the orb right now. OK, so we have material attributes in, material attributes out. So, uh, so we can act on those and uh, you know, add some different effects to different channels. We have to break the material attributes. So just drag a wire, break material attributes, and we have all of that stuff. I'm going to drag a wire here from the base color and make material attributes and plug that into the output. And I'm just going to spend a second here just uh, plugging out all those together. Make sure everything's plugged in, because you know I don't want to lose any information along the way. Because if you leave a, a, a wire unconnected, it's just going to drop that information, right? So even stuff that you're not using, it's a good practice to just keep everything connected, just in case. This takes a second. Opa. OK, so let's just uh, space them out. Press Q to align, space them out a little bit more. Great. I'm going to just save it, just in case. Save the character material as well, so we can see if we have broken it or not. Is there a way to auto-connect all of this? Hmm, it's a great question. I don't know. If there is one, if anyone knows, please share in the chat. It would be really convenient for us. OK, saved. Uh, it's compiled. It's, uh, it looks fine, so we haven't broken anything. OK, so let's start making the effect. So uh, this effect, we're going to start by making a timeline for it so we can animate it in and out, right? But uh, when I think about timelines, I think like even if you Google like Unreal Timeline, the first thing that comes to mind, right, is a blueprint timeline. So let's just quickly look at it. I'm going to just open up the blueprint for my character. And if you drop a timeline here, let's go look at character effects. It's a CPU timeline where you can create a float curve, you can create keyframes, and you can animate those keyframes, and you can pass on those values to your shader. You know, using this output here, and you can set the the uh, scalar parameter on your materials. But we're not going to be using a CPU timeline. We're going to be using a GPU timeline. So what do I mean by that? Toss it aside. I'm going to do this uh, animation to fade in and out in the material itself. So um, let's go back into the material here, material function. As a temporary thing, just uh, just well, I can, uh, so I can build the, the, the effect itself, I'm going to set a temporary one by getting a time node. And uh, I will divide that by a duration. So I'm going to drop a scalar parameter, hold S and click, duration. And I want this effect to take about. 0.65 seconds. And I'm going to frack it so the effect keeps repeating forever. Because uh, the frack node returns the fractional part of a float, right? So time keeps counting on forever, it keeps going on. But if you add a frack 
your time only will only go from uh, 0 to 1 and 0 to 1 and 0 to 1 like a sawtooth pattern. So you can keep seeing the effect be repeated so you can work on it. Like this, if you expand it and you have live nodes on, you're going to see it. That's how it looks like. So that's our timeline. Um, our glow effect, if you can, let's look over here. It's just a Fresnel, right? Fresnel effect. So what is a Fresnel effect? I'm going to, um, the Fresnel is, let's look at it again. See, so we're highlighting the, the, the face or the triangles of the character that are facing away from the camera. And what's facing towards the camera? It's dark, right? So in order to do that, I'm going to get the pixel normal of this character, and I'm going to do a dot product between that and the camera vector. If we right-click and preview this, we're going to see our character here. You see that... Uh, the faces that are facing towards the, the camera are highlighted, and whatever's facing away from the camera, like sideways or away from it, are dark. So we want the opposite of that. So for that, we do a one minus. You can type one minus, or you can just hold O and click on the graph. Great shortcut. So let's look at that. Start previewing. And that's more like it, right? But I want on like a nicer curve. I don't want a linear fall off for that. So I'm going to drop a power node. You can just uh, type power or hold E and click on the graph. I'm going to call this a uh, Fresnel exponent. And uh, let's plug it in. OK, so this is a power of 0. I'm going to do a power of like C2, how it looks. More like it, 3. So 3.5 is a good exponent for this, right? Let's keep it like that. And uh, I want to multiply that by a color, because I want like an orange-ish thing. So to multiply this by a color, I'm going to use a vector parameter. And you can uh, hold V and click on the graph to drop it. Well, what? OK, sorry. Just freaked out here for a second. Let's call it uh, Fresnel color. And I'm going to do like a hue of like 3 or 4, maybe 4, saturation or like very saturated, 0.5, and a value of like 9, really bright. Multiply that <clears throat> by this, and let's see how that looks like. Yep, yep, it's, it's somewhere around that. Like, like let's increase the exponent to maybe 4.5. Great. So we just have to multiply that by our timeline over here. Oh, one note. The timeline is going from 0 to 1, right? 0 to 1, back to 0 to 1, back to 0 to 1. I want it to go from 1 to 0 because I want it to kind of be like a slap, like, you know, it's like a slap that burns after, you know? So I want it to kind of start bright and fade out, and start bright and fade out. So I'm going to do a 1 minus on this timeline here. And multiply all that together. Let's just separate it so it's more readable. So since we're working on the emissive color, a new character might have some emissive to begin with. You know, you don't want to be messing with that. Let's just add them together instead of replacing it. So let's add this. And this goes into emissive color. And let's uh, save and look at it in the viewport over here. You can play the game and run around while it compiles. OK, so our character is flashing. Wonderful, works. This is great, right? But uh, we actually want this to be triggered by like either the damage or like any gameplay event, right? So we're going to simulate that with a key press on the, on the keyboard, because we have no enemies, no, no way to deal damage to the character. So let's uh, simulate that. So I'm going to be opening the, actually, I'm going to start on the material itself. So this is our timeline. We're going to be replacing this thing here with a GPU timeline. So uh, you know the CPU timeline is the, the node in Blueprint. We're going to be doing the GPU one. So how, the, how would the GPU timeline work? We would make it work by getting the time, and we subtract uh, the game timing seconds from it. Let's call it activation time. 
going to default it to like minus 999 just so it like, doesn't interfere with anything as you start the game. So how does this work? So we're going to just stamp the game time into this parameter whenever the character gets hit. And the shader does the rest. So if you get the time and the activation time, at the time of the activation, the result's going to be 0. But as time goes on, the result goes up to uh, 1 and 2 and keeps counting up, right? If you divide that by the duration of 0.65, it's going to take 0.65 seconds for this result to reach 1. So what we do at this point, we clamp it at 1, because we just want to be between 0 and 1, right? So back here, we don't need this frac anymore, because we're not uh, previewing it anymore. We can saturate it, and we keep the 1 minus here, because we want it to go from 1 down to 0. So let's uh, save this and see how this looks like. Also, I'm going to have to create the logic so we can activate it in the Blueprint. OK, as it compiles, let's, uh, let's work on that. So I want it to be a button press. So I'm going to do a, there's a keyboard key 1. I want to press it. I'm going to drag a reference to our skeletal mesh over here and do a set scalar parameter value on materials. And let's connect it here. And uh, the parameter name is the activation time, as we've just named it over there, activation time. And the value we're going to be setting to it is game time in seconds. And let's compile it, save it. And uh, let's play the game. Well, actually, we can also uh, print a string just so we know it's being triggered in case the effect doesn't work. So let's call it hit. So we're going to be seeing those messages on the top left of the viewport. Okay, here we are. And we press the button. There you go. It works. Every time you press the button, we can see here. I'm going to be stamping the time of the game in seconds in that uh, variable, and the shader does the rest of it. Right now, it's a linear time, right? So uh, if you want it to be like a more interesting, more interesting curve, you can apply a, a power to it as well. You can call it fade exponent, something like this. We do like a, even a power of four and uh, rewire this. So instead of uh, being a one to zero straight fade. It has like a nice curve with like a deceleration at the end. All right, so we are done with this uh, this first part of it. Now we're going to be working with the shell mesh, right? So for the shell mesh, bring it over here. Uh, just save all of this. Let's close it. So first of all, we're going to be making a texture for the shell mesh in in substance. So uh, if, you do, if you're not familiar with Substance Designer, here I have like a, a texture that I already built on it. It is a, a program to make textures, you know, kind of like Photoshop. But instead of uh, stacking layers, building up your texture like that, you're actually chaining operations. And you can use a lot of procedural noises and uh, lots of blends and blurs and, and whatnot. And you're going to build your texture in that kind of non-destructive way. So for example, build a big chain of operations here. And uh, you have this result, but you can always go back and uh, change some of the operations. And it, it's going to propagate those changes all the way to the end. I'm going to be going really fast on this one. Can't explain too much. But if you're interested, I have created a course for our station learning called Creating Real-Time VFX in Unreal Using Substance Designer. If that's interesting to you, take this opportunity. OK. So for the fire uh, noise, I'm just be creating a quick one. I'm going to use the Crystal Stew node. Crystal 2. When you look at it, it has like some good attributes that we want. It's uh, mostly vertical. If you press spacebar, you see the tiling. See, tiles. One good thing about substance, like the textures are always tile by default. And we're going to be scrolling this effect, right? We're going to be panning the noise. So we need the tiling. So uh, it is uh, mostly vertical, like uh, has a directionality to it, but also has like some crisscrossing shapes, which is like a great starting point for fire. So uh, since this is going to be panning vertically, I want more detail on the vertical side, because otherwise it's going to be repeating a lot. 
Um, so since I want more detail on the vertical axis, I'm just going to change the width over here, just half of the height. You see that the noise just kind of recalculates itself, so it keeps the same proportions. If you want to check this noise square expansion to box over here, you're going to see that the noise just stretched or squashed. But if you check it, it's going to recalculate it like in a really clever way, so it still retains the same aspect as before. Just you just have twice as much as information. So the first thing I'm going to do with this is I'm going to do a blur HQ on it. And quality one, low intensity, just because this noise is sort of sharp. And this is going to kind of get a little bit funky if we don't blur it a little bit. And then we're going to use a slope blur. So what is the slope blur? It's a very smart uh, blur node that um, takes your slope input as, as if it was like a height map, and it's going to you know, derive a direction from it and blur it towards or away from the slope. So it's a good node for like, um, getting a height map of like bricks and like chipping the edges of it, the kind of, the kind of thing you can kind of erode things like in a really good looking way. But I'm going to just blur it by itself. So let's, uh, let's hide this for a second. And let's uh, punch up the samples here to 32. And you see that uh, it's uh, puffing the noise, but I want to go the opposite. So I'm going to do, I'm going to use a negative, negative intensity. And you see, it already looks a little bit fiery. You can go back and uh, tweak the blur a little bit, just so like the, the shapes look nice. There's already something quite interesting. I'm going to auto levels it. If you expand here the histogram, you're gonna see that we lost a little bit of a uh, range here. Always happens when you blur, right? So I'm gonna drop an auto levels here. And uh, actually I'm gonna jump uh, to a levels here as well, and I'm going to uh, get this to be more contrasty, like more on the dark side over here, like this. And I want a little bit of a motion blur on it, and for that I'm going to use the non-uniform directional warp grayscale. So uh, at first look, it looks like just like a directional warp. I'm also going to warp it by itself, or actually I'm going to use the blur, the very first blur in the chain here. So let's punch up this intensity here so we can see what's to do, what it's doing. It looks just like a directional blur. But one cool thing about it, okay, 89 degrees, is the length one. So it does a little bit of a you know, smear on the, towards the direction. So let's do an average. And it looks like a bit like a cool non-uniform motion blur sort of thing, but not as intense as this. Otherwise, we're going to be losing a lot of detail. This seems fine to me. Let's auto level this again. And you know, this is uh, already a pretty functional, functional texture. But what I'm going to do here, I'm going to duplicate this and do like a second layer of it. Using um, here on the crystals too, I'm going to increase the scale. So it's a, increasing the frequency of detail. And I'm going to change the random seed just with so something different. So like you don't notice repeating patterns. And uh, you see, like I changed something at the at the beginning, just kind of everything just propagates towards the end, right? But we have to co come back here on the both the blur and the slope blur and adjust them a little bit, just so we have nice kind of sharp details. Yeah, that was great. Okay, so I have like a low frequency and a high frequency one. I'm going to combine both of them with a blend node. I'm going to put the high frequency one on top of the low frequency one with the screen blending mode. And I'm going to use the bottom layer as the mask for the upper layer. So you can see like it adds high frequency detail, but like in a more nuanced manner, you know, instead of just being like a flat uh, blend all over. You can see here that like it's you know adds just a little bit of detail, so like looks much more interesting. So this is great. This is enough for for the for the moment. So let's move on. I'm going to put an output here. Oh, actually, let's check the levels. Looks good. Output. Name this um, character effects fire. And I'm going to output it here using the wrench export outputs. 
and uh, we're done with Substance. Let's go back to Unreal now. So here, I'm going to import my texture. This is the one, right, that we just made. Grayscale, save it. Yeah, so this is good. I'm going to create a, a shell material for the shell mesh now. I'm going to name it M Character Effects Fire. And I can just uh, apply it right away to this uh, mesh over here. And let's drop the texture. And uh, also, I'm going to select this guy over here and click on the teapot so we can see our character here, so you can see what's happening. Temporarily, I'm just going to switch this to an opaque, unlit material, just so it compiles faster as we work. And then uh, later, I'll be changing it to a translucent one. So if you just apply this texture here to emissive color, you get crap, right? Because it's using the character's UVs to map this texture to it. And that's not what we need, right? Because the tech, the UVs could be you know, mirrored like it is here. It could be you know, scaled up and down and uh, rotated. And that's not, just not going to work. So we need to project this texture into the character. It could do with a second set of UVs, but uh, we don't have to because we can use the character's local space position to project that into the character. So um, we can do, like if your character is, you know, a, a, like a more spherical in shape or like a huge blob, if your character is like a car, you know, then you might be having to look into like a triplanar projection. So project from like the sides, front up, from the back and up and down. But uh, since our character is a humanoid, and uh, humans are mostly flat, right? Like most of our surface is like pointing front or back. So it can get away with just a single projection for this. So I'm going to drop a local position node. This will return the position of each pixel in local space, starting from the pivot onwards. So I'm going to drop a component mask by using Shift-C. And we need the x and z axis of it. You can see here on the, the corner of the viewport, the x is going to be our horizontal axis, and z our vertical one. And uh, since that's going to be in, um, in world units, we need to divide that by a number so it's uh, more feasible to like If we would just apply this directly into the texture, we're going to see that the texture is going to be tiny. And you zoom in and you see like the texture tiling so much, right? Tiles every single centimeter. So we can divide that by a uh, texture, let's call it texture tile size. And maybe I want it to tile like every meter or so. So set it to 100 and let's look at that. It's not too bad. The scale, I think it looks, let's try this light slur. It's smaller than that. Good, this is good. Okay. So then we just want to pan this uh, this texture upwards, right? Like fire is rising up. So I'm going to drop a panner node by holding P and clicking on the graph and pass on the coordinate into it and plug that into the UVs. And um, we need to set a speed for it. So as a speed parameter, um, I'm not going to be dealing with like uh, horizontal. Speed, I'm just going to do a vertical one. So I'm going to append vector. For A, which is the horizontal speed, I'm going to add a zero to it. And I'm going to create a parameter for panner speed and uh, plug that into B. And plug that into speed, compile it. And uh, actually, I can preview over here on the viewport as well. So let's add to one. It's panning down, set it to like minus one, panning upwards. That's what we need. You see that since we're doing just a frontal projection, if you look at the character from up above, you see that the texture kind of mirrors at the, the axis over here. And uh, if you look from the side, you see a little bit of stretching, right? And a little bit of mirroring. But uh, it's not a huge issue with this character. Like you could, uh, you could get around this by uh, doing a side projection as well, or like doing like two frontal projections to just like rotate them slightly, and that will cover those angles for sure. But uh, honestly, it does not make a difference in this case. 
So uh, let's just work with a single frontal projection. Okay, so this element is done, right? The second element I want to bring in is a uh, bottom to top gradient. So I want the fire to be uh, the brightest at the feet and uh, the faintest at the, the head. So like the fire is burning from the bottom to top and fading out as it burns up. So we're going to be doing a gradient over the character. So for that, let's uh, mask the Z component of the local position. And we have to divide it by a certain number. Let's uh, call it a vertical gradient size. Type whatever number into it. And I'm going to do a frac. So when you do a frac, you're going to see where the gradient starts repeating, just so like as a visual aid to, to help us kind of you know, size the gradient properly. I don't know how tall the character is. So let's plug that into emissive color. And you can see that it is. It's repeating like maybe four times. So let's tweak this value here. Until the gradient is dark at the feet and uh, one at the top, top of the head. So see 150 is almost there. We can keep dragging this up until we see no black at the head. Uh, uh, there you go. Character is 183 centimeters tall. So like six feet kind of thing. Let's do 185 just to give a little bit of a wiggle room there. But I want to highlight one, one possible issue, which is let's apply a, an animation to this guy here, just so we can preview that. So on the uh, skeletal mesh, it's not the blueprint, right? It's this, just the skeletal mesh I dragged and dropped into the level like this. I'm going to animation mode, use animation asset, and I'm going to apply the run animation. And you can uh, simulate over here so we can see the animation playing. All right, it looks OK. But uh, let's try to tighten this gradient, for example. Let's do like a 175 or 150. And here you see a problem, right? Which is the gradient is fixed on the world, and the character is like running to it. So the line keeps moving around, right? And we don't want that. We want this, this uh, gradient to be stuck to the character. So in order to do that, we're going to be using a separate node that's called pre-skinned local position. So what's the difference between it and the local position? Which is the, the pre-scanned local position will take, will return to the local position of the character at this bind pose. So even if the character moves around, the result's going to be the same. So for example, in the case, uh, we're doing fire, so it's fine to do just a frontal projection. It's OK, like, uh, you're going to be projecting like doing a, almost like if the character's sitting in front of the projector, right? If the character moves like this, you're going to see that the fire texture is going to slide on top of the character, but that's OK for fire. But if your effect is like goo stuck to the character, you want to use the pre-scanned local position. So like you splatter your character with goo, and the character moves around, and the goo does not slide. It stays on the, the surface of the character. So uh, pre-scanned local position, we have to, it's going to give us an error when you plug it in here because we need to use a vertex interpolator for that. That's an easy solution. We just drop a vertex interpolator node. And let's plug it here after the mask. So this node, what it does is it anything that's uh, before it will be forced to execute in the vertex shader. And this is going to be piped through to the pixel shader so we can use it there. So let's apply it here. And you can see that now the character is, the, the gradient is fixed to the character. So no more you know, moving around like this. So let's just uh, change the size again so we can have a more precise size over here. 175, 180, 185. Yeah, 183 is a magical number here. And then I want this uh, gradient to be actual from the, the bottom to top, not the other way around. So I'm just going to have one minus it. OK, so we have our gradient here. 
Uh, and um, you can bring in more elements, you know, if you want to kind of make this uh, more layered, more detailed. You could, for example, do like a Fresnel effect. And um, for the Fresnel, we use the pixel normal, right? Here you could use the vertex normal. Or you could also use the pre-skinned normal, which returns the normal at this position, regardless of like how the character's uh, animating, right? So for example, if you want the character to be kind of, you know, snowed on, for example, there's no sitting on top of the character, it can be, you know, still sitting on top of the character if the character is moving around, just an example. But uh, let's, let's move on. So I just want to combine those two. Let's just multiply them together and see how they looks like. Yeah, it's something. It's something. It could be you no know, more interesting for sure. But um, let's see here. One thing we can do is like we can apply, uh, can duplicate this, the the texture sampler, and uh, create a second layer of the texture, just like we did in Substance. We're gonna just rename those parameters. Otherwise, they're gonna be the same, right? B and add B here, and you can. Uh, Maybe multiply them together and get the square root of that, perhaps. And uh, slightly different speeds and uh, slightly different sizes. Yeah, it's a bit more layered. You can definitely increase this, you know, this contrast over here. Let's uh, uh, like 110, so like 82. So we have like a high frequency and low frequency textures both panning on top of the character. You can also add some sideways motion too to make it more interesting. Let's do that quickly. Remember to uh, make those parameters with different names so they don't conflict with each other. And I plug it in here, and I'm uh, going to be setting those to very small numbers. Otherwise, they're going to be like, the texture's going to be panning horizontally like this. So I just want it to be kind of slightly kind of going outwards or inwards a little bit in uh, opposite directions. It's like maybe 0 0.1 over here, and the other one like minus 0.07, something like this. See, it has more complexity to it already. It's uh, much more interesting. You can also bring in, uh, can do some uh, UV distortion as well, because those are UVs, you know? So you can just kind of distort them like with the flow map. You can or generate a noise, like a vector noise on the character and use that to distort the, the, those UVs. Up to you. So um, maybe let's uh, apply an exponent over here, a power curve, just so it's less linear. And uh, maybe of a two, and then let's multiply that by a color. And uh, preview that here. And the color I'm gonna be setting something like this, like maybe bright orange. Let's see how it looks like. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's something, something. Let's uh, maybe 1.5 exponent. Color can be slightly less saturated, or more than that. Almost one, maybe 0.98, and uh, brighter, maybe. Yeah, yeah, I like this. Okay, so we got this uh, this base working on. So we can uh, now transform this into a translucent material. So we, got, we have to separate the opacity from the color parts. So I'm going to just plug this into opacity and the color straight into emissive. Let's just do a quick clean up and uh, reorganize it. And we have to change the blend mode to translucent. Compiling just takes a second. So here is our 
shell mesh running around. Let's test it, just kind of overlay it on top of a character. So I'm, see, I made a copy of the of the mesh here. Going to make them be sitting on the same spot, and I'm going to reset the material. Ooh, okay, that didn't work. They fell out of sync. Okay, so if I do this and simulate again, yeah, see? It's overlaying just fine. So this this works. Let me just uh, turn off the motion blur here so you can uh, inspect it. And you can see there's an error here, like a little problem, right? So at the foot, it's called, like the foot's kind of punching through the, the shell mesh. is getting a little bit confused there. So one thing we can do to fix that is we can push the shell mesh outwards a little bit so it's always slightly you know, closer to the camera than the, the character's mesh is. One way of doing this will be getting the vertex normal, multiplying that by uh, like a push value, let's call it push, and plug it into a world position offset. So that's going to take the, ver uh, the, the normals of the vertices as, as a vector, right, and just kind of push the mesh towards that direction. So it's going to puff up the mesh. So see, you can play with the slider, and uh, it's puffing up our shell mesh. But still doesn't really fix the foot issue. So what gives? It's uh, this is probably probably uh, some some sort of issue, like on the normals. Maybe it has like split normals here in the foot. Not necessarily a problem, right? But it's just a, it's a quirk of the mesh that we can work around by doing a different method of pushing things, which is. Instead of using the vertex normal, I'm going to get a vector pointing towards the camera and just push it towards the camera a little bit. You're not going to notice any difference at all. It's not going to be visible, but it's just going to be a little bit closer to the camera. So to do that, we get the camera position, camera position, and uh, subtract from that the world position. And we normalize that because we want this vector to be have a length of one. And then we multiply that here by our push value. Let's compile that and see how that looks like. So when you get the camera position and subtract the world position of it, the world position is the position of the vertex, right? You're just getting this vector that points from the vertex to the camera. So if we just multiply that by a value, just pushing the vertex towards the camera. But uh, all of the vertices are converging towards the camera. Too much. Maybe minus one. Now see if I do a negative value, I'm pushing away from the camera, so it's hiding behind the mesh. So one, two, three, 10, 20. Yeah, something's not uh, playing along well with this foot here. Yeah, that's an issue. I don't know. I don't know what's going on here. Let's see if my, my test has the problem. It doesn't, doesn't happen on my test for some reason. I don't know, but anyway, those files will be uh, available on GitHub. You can uh, pick them up and deconstruct them and see what's going on there. So let's uh, just save this and move on. So next up, I want to uh, fade this uh, mesh in and out, right? Just like we're, we have a, have a timeline for the one on the character surface. Just want to have a timeline for this one as well. But uh, let's just delete those fellas over here, and I'm gonna start working on the on the character blueprint now. So inside the blueprint, I'm going to add. Oh, I'm playing. Sorry, I'm gonna stop the game. I'm gonna add a skeletal mesh. No, not a simulation. Uh, just a skeletal mesh component. And see, it's already a mannequin. I'm gonna make it. Uh, a child of the, the main character mesh here. Let's reset the position and rotation. I'm just gonna move it outwards a little bit and uh, compile save. So as we play and run around, you see we have this dummy attached to us. It has no collisions or nothing. We're gonna use that for the shell mesh. So let's uh, apply the shell mesh on it. I mean the shell mesh effect shader on it. And 
there it is, right? We can run around and we're moving this fire dummy around with us. So now I'll, I want it to fade in and out. So for it to fade in, I'm going to use the same uh, logic as we did for the accidentally opened up the documentation here, sorry. I'm going to use the same technique. Oh yeah, the feed might have some uh, verts slightly below zero in local space. That could be messing with gradients. You know what? I think you're right about that. That could be it. Yeah. So um, you can just uh, fix that by shifting the gradient. You can subtract a number from the gradient before you divide, and uh, that should fix it, probably. So yeah, I think you're right. OK, so to do the timeline, let's go back to our material here. And um, you're going to be working, timeline is going to be working on the opacity, right? So we're going to be multiplying something after this whole thing here. And again, the timeline is the GPU timeline. It's time minus the activation time. Let's default to minus n9. Divide by uh, activation duration. I want it to be like maybe 0.7 seconds. And I want to saturate this. So we, again, we stamp the time of the game time in seconds to this parameter. And uh, since it's been subtracted from time, you're going to have a counter that goes from 0 onwards. It takes 0 0.7 seconds to reach 1 and gets clamped at 1 by the saturate node. So uh, let's just test it, just make sure we got it. Again, we have to go back into the character blueprint, and I'm going to add a functionality to activate that. Okay, so this is happening on button one. I just want to move this aside. I'm going to use the key two on the keyboard to do this. So I'm going to get a reference to this mannequin that's our dummy over here. I'm going to rename it to shell mesh so we're not confused. Drop it over here and a set scalar parameter value on materials. Only press two. And we're going to be activation time. And we set it to game time in seconds. Test it. Okay, actually, I don't think this is going to work right away because our character is already visible. So um, you can make this default by like a huge number, so it's not active yet, just just for testing. Okay. So it's going to be default like a huge, huge number. So as we hit play, time is going to be much lower than that, so it's not visible. Time now, compiling. Yeah, so we press two, and uh, did it work? Let's double check here on the event graph. Ah, I misspelled it. Activation time. No, activation time. There you go. Now it works. See, just got to spell things right, and they work. But you see, if we keep pressing the button, the effect just kind of restarts from the, from the beginning. We want, it to be, we want it to be able to fade it out as well. And we're going to do that with a GPU timer as well. So let's uh, build up that timer a little bit. So the same way I've, did, I've done this activation time, let's just bring it back to minus 99 as default. Let's uh, duplicate that and uh, rename those parameters to deactivation time, deactivation time, and uh, deactivation duration. I want it to be a slower fade out, so I'm going to set it to like maybe 3.5 seconds. And then we also want it to be the opposite of the activation, right? It's not going to be going from 0 to 1, but rather from 1 to 0. So we've got a 1 minus it, 1 minus it like this. And how do we combine this? So a way I found to combine them is I'm going to subtract the activation, I mean, the deactivation time from the activation time, saturate, and get the ceiling of it. And I'm going to multiply this on the activation part of the shader. And I'm going to get the max value between those. I know it's getting a little bit confusing, but uh, believe me, it, it, it makes sense. And uh, we have to also go back to the blueprint logic. 
and make it so we can deactivate it as well. So uh, for that, I want to use the flip-flop node. So flip-flop. So you see, every time you activate the flip-flop, it's going to either kind of return A or B, A or B, A or B, like this. So um, A is going to be activation, and uh, B is going to be deactivation. So uh, I'm going to just rename this over here, deactivation time. And let's test it. So we press 2, fades in. 2 again, it fades out very gently. I want to just quickly add uh, a power curve to that, so the fade out is more interesting. So I'm just going to add a power uh, fade out exponent. Let's say it's exponent of like 4 maybe, or 5 even, just so it's uh, sharper with a like a more deceleration towards the end. OK, so activate and deactivate. Cool, so this is working. So what's what's missing here is just making this mesh overlay our character perfectly. So um, in order to do that, I'm going to close this. On the character blueprint, I'm going to use a node that I was not aware of until recently. It was Alex and our team that showed me it. Alex, thank you so much. Which is called, let's drag the shell mesh over here. Set master pose component. And the shell mesh is the target, and the master bone component will be our mesh. And we want to execute that on begin play. So as soon as this uh, blueprint enters the game, we want to we run that. So uh, what it does is like it makes the shell mesh think, OK, so whatever that guy does, I'm going to do as well. It just mirrors the same motions. So we have this uh, running dummy over here. So what's left is just to move it back to the same position as the, as the character. And uh, we're pretty much done. Fade in. We are on fire. Fade out. Fade in. And you can still flash the character because we built that on the character shader itself. And uh, that's it for the presentation today. So if you, if you happen to have questions later, or if you're still watching this uh, offline later, you can uh, always you know, reach out to us. You can uh, tweet at us or message us in ArtStation, Twitter. You can find me very often on the Real-Time VFX Discord channel as well. Thank you so much. Bye.